everybody. We're excited that you're here to join us for critical conversations that foster comprehension for young readers. I'm Dr. Sophie Ladd and I'm joined today by my colleagues, Dr. Jenny Wimmer and Dr. Laura Bauer Phipps. We're gonna take a moment to introduce ourselves and how we come to you today to have this wonderful dialogue and conversation around supporting comprehension in broad ways. I'm Sophie Ladd and I'm an assistant professor here at UNLV. I'm also the director of the Zeter Literacy Center here on campus, as well as the director of the Southern Nevada Writing Project. I come to you today as a teacher, a scholar, and a researcher. The things that I love to focus on in my practice particularly are how do we use children's literature to engage children in conversation in the classroom, particularly in the K-5 setting. You'll notice today that many of the things that we do focus are around read alouds and using children's literature. I hope that you enjoy this session as much as we have in preparing it for you all. I'm Lara Bauer Phipps. I'm speaking to you from Connecticut where I'm a professor at Southern Connecticut State University. I'm the coordinator of our elementary and elementary bilingual programs. And I also teach in the women's and gender studies program. My research focuses on difference within teacher education. And before moving to Connecticut, I was a student at UNLV and what feels like a lifetime ago, I was a teacher at Green Valley High School. Hi, I am Dr. Jennifer Wimmer. I'm coming to you from Utah. Um, I am an associate professor in the Department of Teacher Education at Brigham Young University. I'm also a proud graduate from UNLV. Um, uh, and my research focuses on the intersection between new literacies, disciplinary literacies, and teacher education. Thank you everybody for being here. A few housekeeping um, things to mention. You'll notice at the bottom of the screen you have several functions that you can use to engage in conversation with us today. We encourage you to participate. This is not just for us to lead, but for you to engage in critical conversation with all of us and your fellow educators, teachers, parents, and whomever else might be here to join us. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll notice that there's a Q&A function. We encourage you to type in questions throughout this session that we might come to an answer throughout the presentation or at the end pending time. We also encourage you to use the chat box. The chat box can be used to engage again in a conversation related to the read aloud or things that you're noticing and want to share with your fellow um, fellow attendees here today. So, and then finally, there's a raise the hand function. At times in our presentation today, we might ask you to raise your hand and offer an idea, speak, um, and join us in this dialogue. So please feel free to use any of those. So let's get started. One of the important things we want to do today is really hone in on the importance of a read aloud. Sometimes we think about picture books as simply tools to read aloud for story time. But really, this whole presentation is about understanding and engaging in conversation and doing that through the lens of a picture book. So we wanted to share with you a read aloud, one of which that has received multiple awards, including the Plora Bell Free Award. I would like to start by reading this to you and Dr. Bauer Phipps is gonna join me in this as well. So let's get going. Dreamers by Yuki Morales. Oh, before I start reading, if you could, and I forgot to mention this in the, in the housekeeping notes, if you could take out a piece of paper, or if you want to type in the chat, you may, we would like you to just jot down things that come to you as you listen to this particular text. I'm not gonna give any other guidance than whatever you think about is great to write down. And we'll talk about those ideas that you wrote in a little bit. Dreamers by Yugi Morales. I dreamed of you and then you appeared. Together we became a more love, a more resplendent life, you and I. One day, we bundled gifts in our backpack and crossed a bridge outstretched like the universe. Adios, corazón. And when we made it to the other side, thirsty and awe, unable to go back, we became immigrants. And I'm pausing because I want you to also, and I, I should have mentioned this before, 
When we read books together, we want to notice not only the text and the words, but the images. Migrantes, you and I. The sky and the land welcomed us in words like us in words unlike those of our ancestors. There were so many things we didn't know, unable to understand and afraid to speak. We made lots of mistakes. You and I became caminantes. Thousands and thousands of steps we took around this land until the day we found a place we had never seen before, suspicious, improbable. Unbelievable surprising. Unimaginable. We didn't need to speak. We only needed to trust. And we did. Books became our language. Books became our home. Books became our lives. We learned to read. To speak, to write, and to make our own voices heard. Someday, we will become something we haven't even imagined. But right now, we are stories. We are two languages. We are lucha. We are resilience. We are hope. We are dreamers, soñadores of the world. We are love, amor, love. If you could just take a moment Write down your thoughts about this text. Feel free to share an idea in the chat if you'd like. I'm just going to give you a couple minutes to sit with this text. sitting here reading your messages. Oh, and I see some former students that are responding. So I'm reading this text as culturally, culturally relevant to students who identify it as Hispanic and Latin X. Wonderful pictures. Yes, yeah, she is a beautiful artist. Um, Nui Morales is both the author and the illustrator of this text. I love the code switching, the different languages, thinking back to connections of being your own in your own country. I love that. So just a little bit about this text. So I, I mentioned earlier that this is an own voices book. So Yugi Morales, as you can see on the screen, immigrated to the US in 1999 with her son Kelly. And this is actually a real experience that she had at when she visited the library and was trying to teach her little boy to read. And throughout this book, she just talks about those experiences that she had, which you notice in verse. And additionally, the images that she created, she talks about how those images particularly flat colors and instances of her cultural upbringings. 
And so we just wanted to lead with with a read aloud for today. And we're gonna come back to that read aloud as we offer some strategies related to conversation and questioning and dialogue in the text. To get us started, um, we want to be able to be, to be thinking about what are the theoretical perspectives that um, underpin our thoughts about reading, about, um, and today when we talk about reading, we're gonna be talking about reading print, um, printed words on the page. And so when we think about a really traditional notion um, of comprehending, we might come at it from a modernist or a little literal perspective, where we think that the meaning's located in the text. So you might be thinking back to a school experience where you may have approached a teacher and said, you know, can, and ask a question about, uh, about the content and the teacher says, well, did you read the text? And so this gives, a, this gives the idea that, um, that meaning is located in the text, the text becomes the all knowing and that we're as readers supposed to go there and that we don't bring anything, but that we're somewhat of empty vessels that the text is going to fill us with. Um, we, we wanna move away from that idea. Um, when we move into transactional, this becomes the work of Rosenblatt where we think about that we're spotlighting the reader as well, that the reader brings something to, um, to the text. And so um, she talks about that the reader has knowledge, the text has knowledge, and when those two come together, what's created is the poem, which I think is so beautiful. But we're really valuing that the reader is a person with thoughts and feelings and experiences and that we bring those to a text. Um, when I think about this and what this means in the classroom, um, I've thought about being part of a book club. Perhaps you have discussed a conversation or had a conversation with people um, around a favorite text and you walk away with different experiences and, and what's most important. And, and that's because we come at a text as, as different humans with different backgrounds. So we want to bring that same recognition to, to the young children that we're working with, that we honor who they are, um, their backgrounds, um, their cultural experiences, their lived experiences, um, and that they bring that to every text that they interact with. Um, finally, we wanna look at this from a critical perspective. And this is where we wanna spend most of our time um, today talking about is that we think about the text is never neutral, that there's no such thing as, as a neutral text, that every text is imbued with power. Um, and we wanna think about who's speaking, but more importantly, who doesn't get to speak. Um, what's the power relationships? What, who, um, who is telling the story? Who is being silenced? And, and so that texts are created, again, as it says, within social, political, and historical contexts, and that we have to take that into consideration of who the students are, who are we as teachers, and how are we presenting and offering up opportunities for children to learn and think um, and construct their own knowledge. All right, so if we look at this, we wanna um, be able to define comprehension, which there are a million different definitions of comprehension. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm drawing on the work of Snow and Sweet, where we're looking at this idea that um, as readers, as we interact with the printed word, that we're simultaneously extracting and constructing meaning. And so we wanna think about this idea of extracting meaning. We um, notice right now there's a really big push around the science of reading and looking at phonics. And that becomes really, that's important, that children can decode words. But comprehension doesn't just mean that we can decode, or um, one of my favorite phrases is bark at print, that, that we're not just saying the words, but that we're constructing meaning, that we have images in our head, um, that we're making connections um, as we're interacting with text. And so we want to think of comprehension very broadly of, of what, um, what the reader's doing, what the text brings, and then also just how, how things are, or the conversation and the languaging that's happening around that. Um, when we think about the three elements of comprehension, what we have to think about are the reader, the text, and the activity. Um, one of the great things about being a teacher or being a grown-up, um, a, a parent of, of small children, is we know who those readers are. We know what their strengths are. We know what, they're, what they enjoy. We know where we need to um, open up opportunities. And so then we're being really purposeful with the text that we're selecting. 
But what becomes most most crucial for us um, as educators is to really think about what are the acti what's the activity that we're creating around those texts. So um, we might hear the word complex text a lot, but what one of the things I hope that we take away with from this conversation is that it's not the text that's complex, it's the activity. And so that as we attend to those things, the reader, the text, and the activity, that we are setting the stage for, for children to be able to actively engage in comprehending and, and um, growing and learning and becoming. And I'll just piggyback on that. Oftentimes we think about comprehension as asking those who, what, when, where, and why questions. And we wanna push back on that just a little bit today. And we wanna think about comprehension as a critical opportunity to engage in dialogue about text, to develop those own meanings that readers come to. And even the youngest readers, while they may be learning to read, the physical act of learning to read the words on a page, we want to encourage them to read to learn. And so when we read out loud, even to the youngest readers, they have things to offer that text and in that activity and that gauged conversation. And we don't want to narrow our comprehension to just being answering those WH questions. We want to acknowledge the fact that even the youngest of reader has something to say about the things that they're reading or being read. And so we just want to keep that as part of this conversation today, too. And as we think about broadening our sense of what comprehension is, we're not just talking about comprehension of text today. We'd like to shift our focus right now to fostering young children's understanding of difference. So consider this quote by Dr. Sims Bishop. Books are sometimes windows offering views of worlds that may be real or imagined, familiar or strange. These windows are also sliding glass doors and readers have only to walk through an imagination to become part of whatever world has been created and recreated by the author. When lighting conditions are just right, however, a window can also be a mirror. Literature transforms human experience and reflects it back to us. And in that reflection, we can see our own lives and experiences as part of the larger human experience. Reading then becomes a means of self-affirmation and readers often seek their mirrors in books. Think back to the Yui Morales book. And what I'd like you to do is in the chat, just type which students, and I know some of you are thinking about this already and have thought about this already, but which students will see themselves reflected back in the book Dreamers? And again, you can, you can jot that down or, or put it in the chat for us. So as we've talked about this book, um, because the, the three of us have grown to love this book, there are so many kids and so many families who could see themselves reflected back. So we've thought about the race of the, of, of, of the characters in the book, and certainly kids who speak a different language, kids, with, kids who are immigrants, kids with single moms. That story of migration to the United States, absolutely. This is a book that has a female protagonist, which doesn't happen in all of the books that we read to kids. And of course, this book can be an important sliding glass door, an important window. So I'd first like to talk a little bit about mirrors and why they're so important. Mirrors tell kids that they matter. They tell kids that their life and their experiences are important enough to be in a book. And there's so many children, I would say all children need to see mirror, need to have mirrors in, in books. But I'm gonna focus on race right now because that seems to be at the forefront of our national collective consciousness. Um, and we seem to continually be at the point of crisis when it comes to serving children of color in our public schools. 
I am also happy to talk about other forms of difference during our discussion at the end, um, especially I can speak um, from my role as a scholar who studies sexual orientation in schools and my related experience as a lesbian mom who selects books for my own two small children that provide mirrors of our families. Again, mirrors tell children that they matter. And mattering is sadly not the message that children of color receive from their schools and from the outside world. So consider some of these statistics. Children of color are unlikely to see their faces reflected back to them in the faces of their teachers and the administrators at their schools. So think about CCSD in particular, 76% of students are people of color compared with only 35% of, of teachers being people of color. And I'll say in CCSD, you're doing so much better than we are in Connecticut. Our numbers in Connecticut are more like 50% students of color, 40 to 50, and 90% white teachers. So our students are even less likely to see themselves reflected back in the faces of their teachers. Um, in CCSD, only 31% of administrators are people of color. And so having so many fewer teachers and administrators of color than there are students of color sends a message that people of color have less of a role in schools and less authority. And because books carry weight, they can be part of a counter narrative around who matters in schools and who belongs in schools. There's a long-term effect on kids of feeling like they don't belong in schools or that they don't matter in schools. So in Nevada, the overall high school graduation rate is about 84%. For white students, it's above average, 87%. For black students, it's just 72%. For Latinx students, 83%. So it's still below average. And in CCSD, the, the numbers are comparable. 85% graduation rate overall. So a little bit better than the state average, which is great. 89% graduation rate for white students, 84% for Latinx, 76% for black students. A scholar, Monique Morris, characterizes this situation of um, different graduation rates by race by saying that students are pushed out of the system. She doesn't talk about dropping out, but she talks about being pushed out by a system that doesn't adequately recognize or support students of color. Students receive a message, not just from the absence of books, but also from their teachers that they don't belong. Black students in Nevada are consistently two to three times more likely to be suspended from school than white students. And we can't think that this is a high school problem or a secondary ed problem um, because disparities in disciplinary actions occur as early as preschool. Nationally, the preschool population of black students is 19%. So of all of the preschool students, 19% of them are black. Of all of the students suspended from preschool, 47% of them are black. These students especially deserve mirrors to show them that they have a place in schools and a place in school curriculum. So there's constant messaging that they don't matter. Children with marginalized identities, and whether that's a racial identity, a gender identity, immigration status, family structure, or something else, need to see themselves reflected in books that they and their teachers read. But it's not just mirrors that are important. Windows are essential, especially in diverse classrooms and diverse school districts like CCSD. Windows are an important way of developing empathy and understanding in young children. So we think about white children, it's important that white children develop a sense of cultural humility. There's this tendency of those of us who are white to talk about diverse books and the opposite of that is kind of normal books. But really it's books featuring characters of color and books featuring white characters. We just don't name that whiteness. We just don't even see that whiteness. There aren't race neutral books. And we could say the same things about all kinds of difference. As Dr. Wimmer said, there are no neutral books. So it's up to us to provide windows and name the windows into which students can look to see other worlds. And this isn't just about white students understanding students of color. We need to understand that when we say children of color, this is not a monolith. There are all kinds of 
different children within this category. It's important for our Latinx students to understand the experiences of our Black students, for our Black students to understand the experiences of our students who are Asian, Asian Pacific Islander, and for our AAPI students to understand our American Indian and Native American students, and on and on and on. Books provide windows for all kinds of children to come to understand all kinds of children. And as we're developing empathy in young children, um, we also wanna provide sliding glass doors so that children can engage with others in other worlds. And as we do this, we need to think about the language and the framework that we're providing for children so that they can talk about what they see in the other worlds. Um, children's literature is such an important foundation. Um, and I will um, put a link in the chat to share with you a resource for talking about race with children as, as you engage with some of these books that provide windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. So finally, I wanna speak directly to those of you who identify as white, like I do. We really can't place the burden of choosing texts with characters of color on our colleagues of color, or those, those few teachers who are people of color. People of color have carried the burden of anti-racist work for far too long. If you work in grade level teams, be the person who suggests texts that will be mirrors to children of color. Don't wait for your colleagues of color to do that. It might feel uncomfortable because those of us who are white have not necessarily grown up talking about race, but our discomfort is a lot less important than the education of all children. And if you need to blame it on someone, tell them that Dr. Ladd from UNLV said that you had to choose books with more diverse characters, with characters who will be mirrors and windows and sliding glass doors, because all children deserve mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. All children need mirrors and windows and sliding glass doors. All children need children's literature. I feel like I want to clap for Dr. Bauer Phipps right now. Um, not because she just told you this, blame it on me, but because of all the wonderful information she gave us, that framework for understanding why we should even choose children's literature as a vehicle for understanding and conversation and critical literacy. So when we think about children's literature like dreamers today, this provides us a space to talk and have critical conversations, to offer spaces for interpretation. And today we're not just speaking to the teachers and students in this panel, but we're talking to families and children. We're talking about empowering all of our readers, whether it be you as a parent or a teacher or a pre-service educator, to help understand and negotiate these issues of power, to have shared experiences within your community. We're talking to you kiddos out there if you're listening, choosing your own books that give you voice and share and sharing your thoughts. You can be the leader too and saying, hey, look at this book I found. It's me. I love it. Let's talk about it. So when we think about children's literature, some books are great, some books not so much. And I'm going to use myself as an example. Growing up, I love the Bernstein Bears. Those aren't the types of books we're talking about today. We're talking about books that reflect those mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, that's really hard. I don't know where to start. I love the Berenstein Bears. I love Amelia Bedelia. I love the Babysitter's Club. Great. Those are great books to have in your classroom library, but they're not the ones you want to pick up for these conversations. So when we think about places to start, we want to think about ways in which we consider selecting our books. And Harsty and Leland and McDaniel and Nieto, so many scholars in the field of children's literature and even broadly children, or scholars in the critical literacy, critical pedagogy space talk about that when we're selecting books, and these are the books, again, that we would read aloud, these teachable books, these books we pick up to share with our students, and even those that we offer for our students to read, do these books make difference visible? If they do, then we want to think about how 
it, the difference, how do we explore difference and what makes a difference? We want to think about the ways in which these books enrich our understanding of history, that they're not honing in on a silencing a marginalized population, that they are really giving voice to those that haven't been heard before. We want to think about how they begin to take action on important social issues right here in my space. I think about one particular book, and yes, I'm that cheesy. I've got a whole pile. I think about this particular book, The Teachers Marched. We're all, lots of us are teachers in this room. One teacher in this text led a march during the civil rights movement. You probably don't even know about him, but this book gives that voice, talks about taking action. We explore dominant systems of meaning and society and how people are positioned. And we start to question that positioning of other and choosing books that give that space. We don't always pick those books that have the happily ever after because we know that issues in society, politics and history, there isn't always a happily ever after. And children need to be able to talk and discuss these hard concepts and children's literature is one vehicle for that. So I urge you, when you're selecting books, ask your books these questions. And then further, we need to be critical readers as ourselves. We need to model that when we look at text, we talk back to the text. We have dialogue with the text. We're thinking about these issues. And then we also want to empower our young readers to question those things that they read. We want to think about how are the characters represented in the story? Who do you like in this story? Did anybody ask you who you liked? Do you even like anybody in this story? Is there a character you even relate to? Maybe not. Did you notice any characters in the background of the story? And can you tell me more about those characters that maybe didn't have a strong voice? Are there characters in the story you want to hear more from? Or is there another character that you would like to add to that text? How about questions about the way the text is presented? Did the story tell you anything or are there things you want to add? Did, were you able to, would you like to change anything about this story? Is there something that was missing that you as a reader noticed? And I'm talking about just us, not only kids, but adult readers. If there's something missing, is there another book or another offering that we can pair with that to supplement that conversation? Now I want you to think back to dreamers and I want you to answer these questions. What did you notice about this story? How did this story make you feel? I want you to write that down. And then this is a moment in our conversation that if you would like to type in the chat or even offer response to one of these questions, you may raise your hand. So go ahead and do that. How, what did you notice about dreamers? How did it make you feel? Were there mirrors there for you? Were there windows? Was there a sliding glass door that invited you in? We're gonna give you just a couple minutes to think about that. I wonder, Dr. Ladd, yes. uh, people who may have joined us a little bit after, do you want to summarize Dreamers? Oh, I would love to. So you're just coming oh, with us? Yes, I would love to. So Dreamers was written by Yuya Morales. If you joined us a couple minutes late, um, it's about her experience as a mom coming to immigrating to the U.S. And so throughout the story, She talks about her journey, leaving her home with her brand new baby as a single mom coming to the US and how she experienced her life here. Trying to navigate and making mistakes at times stumbling across a library 
or she found a space where she and her little boy began to learn and grow. And the words are so much better than I'm paraphrasing, I have to be honest. Um, and, and she says here, where we didn't need to speak, we only needed to trust, and we did. Books became our language, books became our home, books became our lives, and we learned to read. To speak, to write, and to make our voices heard. she is at the end and then she says we are stories we are two languages we are lucha we are resilience we are hope we are dreamers sonadores of the world we are love a more love and i think just to highlight a few of the things i'll go ahead and read some of the comments i don't know if everybody's looking at chat um there's a comment of, it was a mirror for me that the mom took the kids to the library. It was a good memory. I love that. I think those special experiences. Um, I love that they were excited, willing explorers. Dreamers made me feel hope. Um, it wants the readers to know that dreamers are full of love with their use of repetition. I would like to hear more about her son's adventure and experience. Um, I made a connection with that too. I wondered, I wondered if he would have um, similar thoughts and feelings. Uh -huh. um, they were excited, willing explorers. Um, a window for me of the journey of coming to a new country. And a mirror for finding my love of reading in the library. The page with the officer reprimanded as the mom played in the fountain with a baby made me wonder how often I have been reprimanded. My students were doing something that would be culturally acceptable back home, but not acceptable here. Maybe that was a mirror. I think these are such great insights and, and such great, I mean, when we really, I think, stop and think, because I was listening um, to my two, my two colleagues talk, it just made me think about um, when, I'm, when I'm doing read alouds, that what is the goal what is my goal as the educator? And oftentimes um, it's to complete the story or as a grown up in a child's life, the, it's bedtime. And I think, oh, I'm just gonna hurry and read the story. Um, and that I often don't give children the space to have the conversations, to look at the pictures. I wanna hurry and turn the page. Um, but I love that these questions are thoughtful and they allow for us all to have an educative experience and that, that children have a space to pause and to ask questions um, along the way. And, and I love the connections that you're making back to the book are so thoughtful. And, and so if we think about how are we honoring children so that they also can have these types of thoughtful um, conversations with, with one another and, and also with the grownups in their life. And I want to piggyback on Joanne's question. Um, when you talk about the culturally acceptable back home, maybe it's a mirror, but then I would say maybe this is a sliding door or a window because it invites you in to understand the experience that maybe you haven't had and to further understand others' experiences and taking the other out of it, but then being coming an empathetic um, participant in that experience with Yugi and her son in this particular case. So this is just simply one strategy that we offer to you that helps children to think about questioning a text or in a text that we read aloud or a text that they read themselves. I also, um, we want to send you with, with one more um, strategy and that as we, as we think about how do we start to apply this um, in our classrooms, what can I do um, in my home, that this is another, another takeaway as a strategy. Um, when I talk about this with, with my pre-service teachers, I often talk about how well do we think on our feet. And I think as educators, we pride ourselves that, we, that we're quick to think on our feet. Um, and, and that we are, we're making decisions constantly. But then when it comes time to engage in, in a read aloud um, with, with children, that we, the, I know when I was a pre-service teacher, 
and oftentimes as a classroom teacher, that I would I would carefully select the text and then I would think, and then I'll ask questions at the end. And I never was thoughtful about the kinds of questions that I asked. And so this, um, it's QAR, Question Answer Relationship by Taffy Raphael. Um, many of you may not have been alive when this came about, which makes me feel a little old. Um, but it's such a great strategy and it's something that's just fantastic to really think through. I think it's also helpful um, for the grown-ups in children's lives to think about how are we having conversations around text. Um, another thought I just wanted to put out there that I've heard Dr. Ladd talk so much about is that discussion around text is never happens when the text is closed. The discussion happens before, during, and after the reading of text. Um, and so to make sure that, that we're having conversation before we read. Um, we can take a picture walk. We can explore the ideas that are going to be in there. We can make predictions. Um, and so that so the comprehension is something that's ongoing before the books open, while the books open, and then after the, and then after the book closes. Um, so the these three ideas of QAR is um, where where are we finding an answer, if you will? And so one of the things that is a very low level of comprehension is that idea of right there on the page. So that um, the question does come from the text, there's no inferencing, the answer is found in the text and there is one right answer. And so I can say, who is the main character of dreamers? And that you can put your finger on the page and say, she is the main character. Where do they go when they learn about books? And so we can turn and we put our finger right on the page of the library. There's nothing wrong with those kinds of, of questions. But again, if I'm trying to think about helping my students participate, and so if I ask a question with one right answer, one student gets to, gets to say the answer. Um, and so we want to think about that's what we do usually when we panic. We just kind of ask these really low level questions. And then we wonder, oh, there wasn't a really great conversation around this text today. Well, we just asked really basic questions. And so thinking about how do I expand these? Um, one where we're trying to um, get students to infer is the idea of think and search. So this we can relate um, to Rosenblatt's work where I'm taking what do I know as the reader and what information does the author um, provide me and then how am I making connections? So as a teacher, the question does come from the text, there is inferencing, and there's more than one answer. Um, so these, I'm gonna go to, I think what Joanna, was it Joanna? Joanne, sorry, I put an A at your name. Joanne, um, when you talked about that being reprimanded, um, when we think about it, it doesn't have to just be the words on the page, but as Dr. Ladd talked about, that the images are so crucial. So when we go back to this page here um, of, of when they're in the fountain, that we made a lot of mistakes. It doesn't say that they got in the fountain and they weren't supposed to, but but that we have an image there. So, so the think and search would be, you know, how do you think she felt when they got in trouble? Or why do you think the policeman was upset? And so again, there's information being provided to me in the text, but there's also my own information of when have I done something that I wasn't supposed to do? Or when did an authority figure um, was upset with me? And how did I handle that situation? And how did I feel? And so again, it's requiring students to, um, to infer, to draw on their own knowledge, and, and it's just a bit more complex. And then the last one is on my own. And this is where students are making connections. And, and we can think about um, the idea of text to self, text to text, text to world, but where we're asking students to enter the text um, and, and share their own experiences about this. Um, again, as a teacher, I, or as a reader too, if somebody asks me a question that's right on the page, I'm like, I can find that. I don't have to have read the text and I think I can figure it out. Um, I also love an on my own question because there's not a right answer and I can say enough words that hopefully something sticks in there. Um, but as a classroom teacher, if we're planning our questions with that idea of my, are my students there to think about what they've read? Do they have to search not only the text, but their own 
memories to come up with questions or to come up with answers that we're asking them to be a bit more critical. Um, that we might be asking questions has been have been brought up about about race, about class, about gender. Um, who aren't we hearing from? That that question came up a little bit earlier. Of I wonder what the son's experiences were. I wonder how how he felt about leaving a country and coming to a new country, and and what connections does he have back to back to his family? And and so. What I would like you to do for a moment here, and I'm gonna ask, I'm seeing the same names in chat and I just want you to know how much I appreciate you. Um, but I would like you to put up um, in chat some questions about dreamers. If you are feeling uncomfortable because maybe this is the first time you've heard it, then let's say you can go to um, a fairy tale. How's that? Let's just go with Cinderella. That has things you can talk about, um, but let's let's give our let's give ideas out there about what's a question that's right on the page, what's a question that would be a think and search, and what's a question that would be on my own. So either about dreamers, if you're feeling familiar with that text, or or we can go with Cinderella because that might just be a classic that um, there's there's a version out there that you have heard. And so feel free to put examples in there. Love it. How many sisters? I can, I can put my finger on the page. Mm -hmm. All right, we know the prince was having the ball. Does, how about an on my own? Anyone have an on my own question? And I think with dreamers, it could be, I mean, an on my own question could be, have any of you ever had a time when you had to? How are you most like the main character is what Chanel said? Yes. Yes, that's fantastic. These are great. How about a think and search? This is inferring, which is why you'll teach it in every grade you teach. We, we I love this question. It says in the story dreamers, why did the mother and the child flee from the country? It's a great question. Fantastic. And so I know we want to leave time for questions. I just want to wrap this up of, for those of you who are pre-service teachers, that there's times where as a classroom teacher that you, a principal will come online and say, um, the assembly has been postponed for five minutes. And so you're grabbing a picture book off as a time filler. But I think there's also a time when we have to, we have to plan for I'm going to engage in this read aloud, I'm being purposeful, and that we plan the questions that we're going to ask, we plan um, that we create these opportunities to have conversation. And a lot of times we panic, or I will say, um, as, as the typical white middle class teacher, elementary teacher, I'm a former first grade teacher, um, that there can be a little bit of a panic of thinking, well, can I read this? Should I read this? Um, and what I found was that if I created a space and I read a text that are a lot like the examples um, that Dr. Ladd has given, that it, mostly if I got out of my own way, the students wanted to talk. They, they wanted to be able to share their ideas. And I think the beauty of young children is that they, they're free to have those conversations. They're free to ask the questions. And, and so a lot of times it's more of, okay, I'm gonna ask a thoughtful question and then I'm going to be quiet mm -hmm. and I'm going to learn from what these little humans have to say because they have beautiful things to say. Um, so I hope with this strategy, what you'll take away is that, that as you're planning your lessons and or planning um, the bedtime story for tonight, 
to really be thinking about what, how do I ask different types of questions? And, and how do I ask questions that are going to be open and allow for children to think, for children to ask their own questions um, and to have a conversation that it's not about getting through the book, but it's about comprehending and making meaning um, of the text that we're interacting with on a regular basis. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, where do I go to find all these fabulous books? Um, we mentioned earlier that Yugi Morales is, has won the Pro Belfry Award five times. Um, and that is um, that particular award focuses on Latino and Latinx um, children's literature written by, um, by and for Latinx youth. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, I know that many of you in this space might even be CPSC teachers. And we talked about own voice literature earlier own voice literature, meaning that the character themselves experience that situation um, and often written by um, people of color. And so if you have Get Epic in your school, they've created a beautiful list of own voice picture books that are accessible. So for those of you that are still maybe in distance learning, partially or even fully, you can offer this opportunity. And one other space I want to mention too is our own TRL library, um, Children's and Adult Literature Guide. Amanda Balili here at in, in you at UNLV in our own library downstairs, if you've been to CEB, has done an excellent job creating a very diverse group of children's literature titles, both award winners, blogs, all of them. And so you can certainly go through there. And the, most of the titles that are on those lists we have in our own teacher development resources library. For those of you that are CCSD teachers, please know that you are able to check out books from our teacher development resources library as well. And then I just want us to think about the power of picture books. And, and if it feels overwhelming to do your own searching, the three of us have come up with some of the most renowned titles in this particular moment, because I would challenge you that you constantly need to be building your bookshelf. Um, and what we love about this list we're offering today is that many of the titles, again, are own voice titles. So we range from issues of um, people of color, but then we also have books about families, unique families, where we have two moms, two dads. We also have books like Not Quite Narwhal, where Narwhal's struggling with his own identity. Um, so if you're looking for a space to start, here are some books that we would like to offer for you. Um, and finally, we just want to close with some questions and feel free to contact us at any time. Um, Young Bok Kim, we want to thank him. He has been so wonderful in helping us navigate this panel in Zoom. Uh, we are teachers on Zoom but a panel discussion has been different in Zoom. So if you have a question that you'd like to verbally ask, would you please feel free to raise your hand and talk to us? Um, we can only see each other, we can't see you, but we would love to hear from you if you'd like to ask questions or engage in conversation with us. That's our, always our hope that we get to have this critical conversation. And we just appreciate you being here with us today. Um, we have come to love children's literature together, um, and we hope that you leave this feeling refreshed and renewed and able to have conversations with great books in your own classrooms or in your own homes. So thank you for being here today. There was a question in, in chat about receiving a copy of the, of the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. and we can share that with you. Uh, we will... Um, I know that we have a list of your emails of those who attended, so we can share it through that way. And I love the book. Thank you, Omu, too. Oh, Mora is amazing. Oh, I see some of my students are here. This makes me thrill. Mr. Ladd? Yes. Hi, Joanne. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Um, so my question is this, I teach older kiddos, but I incorporate a lot of picture books still. So I'm wondering that concept of windows, sliding glass doors, and, uh, what's the other one? 
mirrors. Yes, mirrors. Could I, would it be beneficial to teach them that concept and then have them identify that within the book like we did? Or is that too? No, I think that would be know. wonderful. And I also think you can empower your middle schoolers also to then find a book that represents a mirror for them, maybe a window and a sliding glass door. I love that you said that. And, and you know what, the, cr the crossover is a great example. Remember when, um, can I talk about our experience with Kwame? Is that okay? Absolutely. Um, so Joanne came to a presentation with Kwame Alexander, who is the author of this beautiful picture book called Undefeated. I know I'm cheesy. I have a whole stack ready to go. Um, and two of the boys that she brought with her said, and I would, I'm gonna give words to this. They said that the crossover um, represented who they are and how they feel. And they came to speak directly to Kwame at a face-to-face -face conference. And so for them, that crossover book is probably a mirror, right? But for me, that would be a, a window or a sliding glass door. And so I think that you could empower your students then, Joanne, to choose other titles to, that they see themselves in. So. Yes, please do. I love that. And, and the Bishop article is often cited um, in the world of children's literature because sometimes as teachers, we're reluctant to try to talk about things that are hard for us, but kids often are much less reluctant than we are as adults. We have to unlearn the things that we've learned, so. Anybody else? We're here for you. We'd love to talk more. Thanks, Joanne, for popping in. I love when I get to have flashbacks of former students in my space. And then I noticed I had current students here. It makes me feel excited, so. We have just a couple more minutes, so hop in anytime. And hi, Michelle, we see you said hi. Uh, hi, hi, Dr. Glimmer's lad and uh, Bauer Phipps. I had a question, do you have, do you have any recommendations for um, mirrors? or sliding doors for students with disabilities? Yes, okay, so in that, um, in our presentation, the Dolly Gray Award and the Snyder Award um, are two of the most renowned um, award-winning titles for that reflect disability. And um, I don't have it here, but one of my favorites is, um, it's called, oh, I'm missing the title. It's, it's, it's all, um, Chanel, are you still here? What's the um, title? One of my students is here. She's an undergraduate doing a thesis project actually on books with disability. There's a new book about um, a, a man. He wrote it. It's an own voices book about stuttering and it is beautifully written in lyric um, and she's still there. I talk like a river. Thank you, Chanel. I appreciate it. Um, it is a beautiful title and it actually has won multiple awards, but the Dolly Gray Award or the Schneider Award list, and you can access those, Joseph, through the TDRL website that's linked to the presentation today. Thanks, Chanel, for picking up the slack on that one. I appreciate it. So many titles to think of. Other questions that you guys might have, we're here. We're so grateful that you guys attended today. If I had to pick, what is each of my favorite picture books? Oh gosh, Chanel, you can't ask me that question. Like that's asking you, who's your favorite child? I know. <laughs> These ones. These are them. <laughs> Actually, um, gosh, I mean, Dreamers is one of my favorites, but I also love, um, I also love Undefeated, which I showed you already, but. Um, this is one of my newest ones. It's called The Envy, Leads the School Parade. Um, I love this because it talks about another um, experience of coming to the classroom. And so for teachers, um, this little person 
This is actually another own voice one. And Anna Kim immigrated to the US from South Korea. And she was an artist and it's about her experience coming to the classroom for the first time and not speaking the language. And so as teachers, I really appreciate how um, this story is approached again from an own voice and how frightening and scary it can be for young English learners. Um, and that is, this is one of my favorites right now. What are some great two moms and two dads children's books to add to my collection? Great question. Um, so a really simple one is Mommy, Mama, and Me. That's a favorite in our household, um, just because it's not really about the fact that the kid has two moms. It's about what they do during the day. And you know, kids don't need to see themselves reflected as an issue. They can just see themselves and their families reflected as this is, this is what happens. This is what happens within the day. Um, so that's the first one that comes to mind because of that. Dr. Ladd, what? Well, I think that. Um, oh, and take about, three. That's yeah, one. I was. That's what I was going to say. Um, our undergraduate students are often reluctant to share um, books that reflect um, two parents, a mom or a dad, um, or two two moms, two dads. And Entangle Makes Three is actually a true story about two male penguins that fostered an egg. And believe it or not, it lands on the band and challenge book every single list every single year because of that topic. And it's, it's sad to be honest, but I particularly love that one because it's a real experience of the two penguins and how they end up fostering an egg that's not a real egg. It's, and it ends up being a rock and then they put an egg in there for them to raise. And so it's a beautiful book, but, and I think that Band and Talon's book should be read all the time everywhere. So that's just my shameless plug for that. And the, the book is called Entango Makes Three. And again, this, this provides kids with just language and framework. Um, I've heard other kids say to my daughter, how come you don't have a dad? And it's so nice when she can say, well, remember Tango? Because they, they have that framework, even if they don't know other families that have two moms or two dads. And it's natural that kids would wanna know about kids with other skin colors or kids with different family structures or kids with disabilities giving them books as a way of practicing talking about that before they talk to people about it can, can be helpful. Other questions? We know that it's 4.03 and we wanna be cognizant of your time, but we will stay for as long as you want. Um, you are welcome to um, log off if you'd like or unmute and talk to us some more. We won't go until you guys have all decided to leave. So we will be here just ready. Thank you.